<laughs> we're live, JP. We were we were late. I'm I'm going to apologise to everybody. We were late because of me, and I'll explain why uh, during the show. Thank you all for joining us. It is the Axom Bulletin. It is a Thursday, and I'm delighted to be joined by JP Mason. How are you, JP? Just off a train from uh, the north of Scotland. <laughs> I went up for a night to see some friends, so I got back in time. I was hoping there wasn't going to be any uh, train delays or. Uh, obstacles getting here, but it was a, a pleasant journey down the road. The thing is, JP, I don't know if this is something that, that's come to you kind of a wee bit later in your life, but you are a traveller. You love going away to away days with the football, travelling with the music. Um, that's part of you, isn't it? And and when you think about being a Celtic fan and obviously the fact that we uh, as a club will be travelling far and wide this season, hopefully for some kind of European progress, it's right up your street because that is something you, that you yourself, year on year, you plan your, your kind of journeys and you've got a bucket list and there's places you want to go and see. But you're also doing that in the world of music as well. Where would you like to see that you haven't travelled to yet? What's what's still on your bucket list, JP? Oh, definitely like uh, Japan and Japan, South America, places like that. Like They're, they're dream, dream places to go to, either for just... Going to see the places as a as a tourist, or you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to go there for work <laughs> work purposes. Uh, yeah, they, they would be they'd be high up in my list. Those two places, Cause I think I think Japan's probably the the the, the one place where it, it it's so detached from here. You know, mm. it's like completely. Mm. You know, it feels like you're probably going to a completely different world. And yeah, I think that would be the one. And the thing as well, uh, just the other day during the game, we are marrying up, we're collaborating with uh, Celtic Down Under and one of the contributors to Celtic Down Under is based in Japan. So he was talking all about the fact that the club weren't really tapping into the market over there, JP. I found mm-hmm. it really in. It was an interesting discussion that came out of the blue uh, from Liam, who will be on the match days um, far more regularly as the season goes through as well. But I found that quite interesting and hopefully we can uh, obviously get him in touch with some of the people at the club to he, talk he about was, how. Yeah, he was speaking about Rio Hitati and Dyson Maeda like I, months before like they signed. You know, It's like amazing. It was, Amazing I insight. Listened, I listened to that podcast and they, and they, they, they were bigging it. Well, he was in particular was bigging them up and, you know, identify. I guess even as soon as Ange Postacogo came in the door, they were identifying, he was identifying them as possible signings. And, you know, and they got two, two out of the, uh, of the four, you know. It's incredible. Uh, the, the untapped markets. And obviously, it gets to a point, though, JP, that your success breeds that attention from other big clubs. And before you know it, that untapped market, um, everybody's in about it. But I think we got in early, we got some quality, uh, and I'm pretty sure there's still some quality that we can tap into. I am keen today um, to bring up as many comments as possible. There's plenty to talk about. The underwater cabbage salesman, I've often wondered if that is his occupation. Hail, hail, comrades. Uh, we've got Celtic67 coming in as well. You are all watching on YouTube. Uh, please get commenting on all things Celtic today. Get subscribing to the channel. And there is a special offer just underneath in the, um, in the description of the video. If you are interested in coming along to Dunfermline tomorrow night. We've got a band called The Chase who are big Celtic fans. JP, you have seen them at King Tut's, the mug from which you are drinking from at this moment in time. Um, that was a few months back, wasn't it? I think they were supporting somebody up at Tut's. I, I'm not sure if you saw them, but you, de- you definitely told me they were playing. I would have probably advanced the show or, or certainly dealt with the people in charge of the band if it wasn't the band themselves. Uh, I, I I can't. I don't think I did see them. I would. I would remember. I would remember the name. I would have had some sort of uh, footage of them. No doubt. I take usually take a few videos of every band that play, um, just so you can scroll back and go. I oh, remember them. <laughs> Is it about to sell out the Barrowland or something like that? Um, I love. I love how you document things though, because it was photos and obviously video content. And I've seen some of the old stuff, and it's brilliant to look back on JP. Yeah, no, it's, it's good to, well, you, you never know what a band's going to do once they've played Touch, you know what I mean? Like some some don't do that much and others, you know, somebody shared a picture of Jerry Cinnamon playing Touch um, from, I think it was from 2014, aye, 2014. He played, he headlined Touch twice in 2014 
and then well, you know, what he's gone on to do it's like two two Hamdens. He's done he's done all right, eh? We Jerry, he's done fine. He's, he's done, done okay. Yeah. <laughs> the, the thing with this band, um, JP is I get sent emails from you know PR companies that are maybe promoting a single or a tour, and you go through them. This goes back to the days where I would maybe do a bit of writing on the reviews, it's kind of side of things. But I still got our email, so I go through them and I watch the videos. And um, you might watch ten or fifteen, and three or four of them are, are kind of like you know they appeal to your tastes. And I'm watching this video by the chase and this band from Nottingham, and Celtic strips start popping up on the video, and I'm thinking, oh well, wait a minute, that's piqued my interest. And from there, I realised they're playing at Tots, and we married it up so that when they were up in Glasgow on their way back to Nottingham, they've swung by Dal Keith and done a session for us, and then away, away down the road they went, and in the session, the boy's wearing the Celtic tracksuit top and he's talking about Anne's Posta Coglu and, and how they're Cel- why they're Celtic fans and it all comes through their granddad. Brilliant. Anyway, they're coming up to play Dunfermline. If you want to come along, 20% off with the codes underneath this particular video and we are keen to get as many as involved. Donny Boy 67 Afternoon fellas. Hope all is well. And there's Paddy Lavery coming in as well. A wee hour in the Axom shade out of that sun will do for me. Another glorious day. Enjoy it. Uh, make sure that you are well refreshed and well hydrated. I want to start off today because it's a player you and I have spoken about over the over the months and years now, JP on Axon, Lee Griffiths. And there was a show on our channel last night and it was simply, Lee Griffiths, where did it all go wrong? And obviously the story came through that he signed a very short deal with Mandura uh, FC over in Australia, which is the third tier of Australian football. Mm-hmm. Now, I was trying to be as fair as possible on this one because we followed his story. Some might say we followed his demise very closely. He's gone from, I said Celtic hero, he was a Celtic hero, uh, to being freed and being without a club. And then there was a bit of press around him, JP, that he was in training, he was in the boxing training. Uh, Martindale brings him into Livingston for, I think, a week's pre-season, said he was looking fit. But then, you know, there was a bit of interest, he's ended up over in Australia's third tier. Now, I'm going to throw this one out, maybe to play devil's advocate. As his agent said to him, get a couple of games, I'll use it as a kind of trial process, I'll contact the bigger clubs in Australia, they can come and watch you, and hopefully you'll get a contract from a, a better-placed club. Do you think that's the thinking behind this, JP? Well, I mean, it's got there's got to be some uh, method in the madness, you'd have thought, because, I mean, it does sound like he's... You know, playing in a, a league that is way, way down the the pecking order in terms of you know quality, and I, I, I guess why would you go? Oh, it's not as if it's you know just down the road. There's the other side of the world, so there must be some sort of strategy in place in order mm. to see where it can take him. I mean, what, and also just to play two games as, as well. You know, so. I don't know. It's a Scottish manager, isn't it? That's there. I guess they must have maybe some sort of friendship or whatever that he's doing it. I mean, I, I, I just, I just, you know, I just, you don't want to wish somebody ill. You just, if, especially if somebody can't do their job. You know, I would never say to somebody I don't want you to be able to do your job. You know, and uh, I, I guess whatever comes of this will be. You know, but it doesn't really strike me as anything. Other than possibly, like you said, putting put them in the shop window. But how how much of a shop window is two games for a, a lower league team? But this was all called by Brendan Rogers. There you go. Eight minutes, nine minutes, Brendan <laughs> Rogers called this. He said this in an interview. If he wants to keep playing at this level, then he's going to need to adjust, mm. you know, his habits and his, his methods and all the rest of it. And and I don't think he listened. And here we are and 2022 and he's what 31 31 and, yeah and he and, and you know he should still be you know how how can someone who was playing at the level that he was fall so far from uh from from where he was um to this you know and you know those goals against england they are a bit of a long time ago now what was that 2017 um was that when that was those get those goals uh, at hampton yeah, I'm, I'm just yeah. checking. I'm just checking his last cap actually. So the goals against England were back in 2017, like you say, June, yeah. June 2017, five years ago now. JP. Yeah, 
But still, you don't expect someone. I mean, the, the, the concerning thing for him is that if he was training at Livingston and Livingston didn't even want to stick their neck out and and put, a, put an offer to him, that's that's the concerning thing for him. You know that clubs in Scotland aren't even entertaining the idea of training him. So I do. You see the thing, right? And I've seen it. Obviously, I use social media like everybody else, and you get a sense, JP of a cross-section of society or a cross-section of a football fan base uh, and their kind of opinion on certain players. And obviously, it didn't end well at Celtic. You know, the last thing he'll remember, the final act of uh, being booed, basically, remember? Mm -hmm. He he was booed in the friendly game. Mm -hmm. West Ham. Um, So it didn't end well for him. And there's there's this feeling that, ah, you know, he's going to get what he deserves and, and he's ruined it for himself. He's ruined his career. And he's obviously had off-the-field issues. But the reason I'm bringing it up is because I think every single time this happens, JP, you think that that can't happen again. This is a cautionary tale for young, talented players coming through in Scottish football because we're talking about the Scottish game. I'm sure it happens elsewhere. But there does seem to be a huge amount of players this kind of thing happens to. Players who do not fulfil um, their, their potential. And people may say, ah, but he did this, he did that. But he could have done so much more. I mean... I think if you look at an example, Jason Cummins, who's over in Australia, and he's doing very well, um, I, I can only surmise that it done him good to get out of the fishbowl of Scottish football, out of the melting pot of his surroundings and maybe some of the hangers-on and all that kind of stuff, and he's away, and his football career's benefited from it. Is it too late for that to happen to Lee Griffiths? I would suggest... On a, on a domestic level, if he wants to play football and score goals, then he's not going to do it in Scotland. Because it yeah. seems as though no one is willing to give him a chance or maybe the word is out there, but he suggested as much himself. There's people in Scottish football don't want him to play. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I made the comparison a few months back. Don't do what Anthony Stokes did. In fact, longer than that, it's probably a year and a half ago now. Go, don't go the way that Anthony Stokes went. Um, you know, out the game by 30 or 31. And he's not quite there yet, but he's kind of edging towards that. I mean, he was playing for Scotland in 2020. Mm. 2020, he's playing for Scotland. You know, they brought him on to take a penalty. Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and he scored. <laughs> was that, that was a crucial a oh. crucial penalty show, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's a cautionary tale for people coming through in Scottish football that um, if you don't look after yourself, then this is where it can lead. And, and you know, I'm not comparing them as players, but I do remember very early on, we got the opportunity on a Celtic state of mind to speak to Ronnie Dyler. Um, and Lee Griffiths wasn't the player that he pinpointed as being a guy that had to look after himself. He pinpointed Virgil van Dyke mm-hmm. in that interview that we did. Uh, and I think he reiterated it um, in an interview that he, he, was, he did with the 20 Minute Tim's boys as well, whereby he saw a player in Van Dyke that could reach the absolute pinnacle of European football um, if he wanted to live his life differently, if he wanted to change his lifestyle. And obviously, Ronnie was into the whole 24-hour athlete mentality, JP, and some players didn't buy into that, did they? But Van Dyke's gone on um, to do exactly what Ronnie Dyla thought he could do. But I think a lot of changes had to be made in his lifestyle and his approach to um, fitness and conditioning. At no point, or maybe too late in the game, Lee Griffiths has realised this. He's realised that when he doesn't have a contract, he's realised that when he's unable to score regularly in the third tier of Scottish football and he's Mm. sitting there at 31, probably with the the money drying up and thinking, I need to get a contract, and then he's gone and got fit then. Why not be fit when you're 21? You know, if if he could score 43 goals in a season, what would he have scored if he was fit? It's, it's an incredible situation to be in. It's not. It's not the first time it's happened, is it? He's not. He's not exactly an, an outlier or an anomaly. You know, there's 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 a, a list of these um, players who all have Hibs connections. Well, not all, but some have Hibs connections. Something um, in the water down an Easter Road. I. I it's. I don't know. It's just sad because you or I. I mean, there's 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 players out there that, I mean, I, I think I heard Richard Forster say the other night that he was about to retire or something like that, you know, but he obviously, he's got a millionaire wife, he doesn't need to play football, but I would have thought that he'd want to keep playing as long as possible, you know, just because, you know, why would you, you know, Bruni kept playing as long as he could, you know, until probably his body sort of said, right, you need to give it a, give it a break. Mm-hmm. Um 
But I, I certainly, if I was a football player, I'd want to play. I mean, I still play seven aside on a Tuesday. And some, so I remember about probably about fifteen years ago, my boss at HSBC was just like, "You, you shouldn't still be." I, I injured myself, and I and I had to be off work for two weeks or something like that. And he was just like, "You shouldn't still be playing fives at your age." And I was at the time, I was like, you know. I don't know, in like mid twenty, like late twenties, early thirties, or something like that. And he was saying that at that point. So, um, the age I'm now, I still play football, still have the buzz for it. So, why a football player who's doing it professionally wouldn't they want to make use of every single opportunity to play football and and extend their career? If, if people are saying things to you to adjust your 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 diet, your mm -hmm. exercise practices, all of that. If people are saying that to you, then your ears should be open to that. But some people are just, you know, there's too much distraction with other things. There, there definitely is, JP. And I'm probably a bit of a contradiction on this one because I'm always bemoaning the fact that, you know, young Scottish talent and quite a few young Celtic players have left Scotland and gone uh, to places like Bayern Munich, etc. Uh, but on the flip side, and, and obviously a lot of Scottish talent is going to Italy at the minute as well. But on the flip side, I'm saying that, you know, in order for these guys to escape the, the kind of vice that they're in in Scottish football and their surroundings, because a lot of it is that, you know, they're, they're, they grow up with a group of guys that are their best mates. And I remember reading this, I think it was in Charlie Miller's book, where it gets to the point, obviously he was a Castle Milk boy, where you actually do have to make a decision. And what does your pals think of you? If you, you know, all of a sudden you don't want to hang around with them, etc. They, they might then think that you're Billy Big Time. Um, everything, the fame's gone to your head, you've got an ego. So they're kind of torn between their career, which is the fact that they've made it as a footballer, and the group of mates that they've been brought up with their whole life. But if they choose to still run about and do the things that these guys are doing, they'll never make it. Certainly not to the, to the degree that they should. So... Yeah, on the one hand, I'm sick when I see Scottish talent leave leave Scotland, but on the other hand, sometimes it's for the best, isn't it? Because they go away and they've got a different lifestyle and hopefully they can make the most of their careers. Um, the urban culture roasting in, is that the west or the west of Ireland? Uh, definitely the west of Ireland. It's roasting, it's boiling here in Dalkeith as well. Uh, you're part of Glasgow. Good weather there, JP. Oh, it's, unbe it's unbelievable here, I yeah. Looking forward to getting out in it. Later on, I'm going to a gig tonight. Am I allowed to say that? Am I allowed to talk about music? Am I, I, to I see don't know. Me? I don't know. Look, uh, weather apparently is better than, than music chat. Uh, you know King what? King I've got to disagree. Who? Yeah, King Cree as well? Ah, uh, he's at the, the Kelm Grove Bandstand tonight, so looking forward to Super. that. Super. Well, we've spoken about uh, music twice already, and we're only 17 minutes in, JP. There's plenty more to come. Uh, Keith Oakden is watching in Plymouth. Welcome back to the show. I want to start off, um, now that we've spoken about Lee Griffiths and where his career is going or otherwise, I want to chat about um, Jota and the start of the season that we have seen from this guy. Uh, just going back, obviously, to the fact that you know, we had him in on loan, JP. He came in um, after CCV permanently. And I think when we signed Carter Vickers, I was just thinking to myself, you know, there's no way we're going to get the two of these guys we did. And Jota has started this season off absolutely tremendously. He's actually making the transfer fee look like a bargain at this stage, isn't he? Mm, he definitely is. And I mean, I didn't really get to see the game. In fact, I didn't get to see the game on Saturday, which is obviously... Something you guys talked about on Monday with the, with the whole um, pay per view and non pay per view argument, like why why Ross County couldn't do that? It just seems insane to me that the the rules are in place that it didn't allow them to be or to to bid for the game in any way to be able to show it in their own uh, their own TV station or whatever you want to call it, like online thing. Uh, so I, I was resorted to listening to it on the radio, which was quite bizarre in uh, in 2022 to be listening to a, to a game on the radio I mean mm. no, nothing wrong with that if people choose to do that but I mean I'd rather watch the game if possible but I just couldn't get one of these you know uh, streams that are available uh, whether illegal or non not illegal, not legal um, uh, I, I couldn't get them I couldn't it just my computer was just going crazy with pop-ups and all that sort of stuff. And then I went, no, I'm going to end up with a virus or something like that. So I just mm. just resorted to the radio. and uh, But I did see the highlights. And obviously you see, you see that, you know, three assists. And, you know, on the back of what he did last week against Aberdeen, it's, 
you know, if he keeps that form up, then you know how how are you going to get one? How are you going to get looked at uh, looked over for the international team? He's surely got to be in with a sniff of you know playing for uh, Portugal, which mm. would be something else, I'm sure. I think he was asked about that, and you know he said he you know he would love to play. I think has he been capped already? He might, he might, he might have been capped already. He's got he's got a number of underage caps, but he's never got a, a full yeah, international full, yet. Full international, yeah. Mm. So I mean that he's got to be, you know, I know the Scottish league isn't you know of the highest quality, but when you're performing to those levels, surely it can't be ignored. Um, and then of course there is what he can do for for Celtic and in, in, in this season and. Possibly even at a higher level. Yeah, okay, everyone will go, well, he's not been tested, you know, in a European arena. But we saw him do it against fairly good opposition last season. Mm -hmm. um, Bayer Leverkusen, the away game in particular. Um, and uh, I think he played pretty well against Betis away as well, if I remember. He did. He did, yeah. aye, in the, the white and pink away jersey. Yeah, so I mean, yep. this this I, there's an idea that because we got put out of Bodo Glimt, everyone's like, oh, we were abysmal in Europe last season. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word abysmal to describe Celtic's European campaign. If you compare it to where we are, we're at in the transition of the the team at that time, I wouldn't say we were abysmal. No, I mean, no. Was, and and getting put out of Bodo Glimt, whilst on paper looked a little bit, you know, embarrassing. They're not a they're not a bad side. They've already beaten Roma in the group stages um, of the Europa League. So, mm -hmm. and and this whole oh you got bounced out of three European competitions. It wasn't our choice to join the Euro Europa Conference League. You know, you 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 put into it automatically. It wasn't like we applied to go into another European competition. It was just a case of well we weren't good enough for the Europa League. We weren't quite ready for that level of competition. Clearly, I mean. The home game against Bayer Leverkusen was was you hugely disappointing, but again, it's one of those ones where you go back and watch that ninety minutes. That was near four 0 game. Everybody came. It was almost universal that night. Everybody came out going, "You were never as bad as four 0 in that game." Like we had really good chances, and then mm -hmm. we gave them a game in Germany. And so Jota, going back to Jota, I think it's really exciting. I've, I've never been as excited as to watch Celtic play in the flesh for a long, long time. You know, I, I, I found out I got a ticket for Kilmarnock on Sunday and I'm just so buzzing to go and see see them play. You know, when you just you see the highlights from Saturday, you're like, oh, I just want to see them play wherever, you know, like uh, home or away. Um, the team is, a, is an exciting team to watch. And, no, they are. And, and, and Jot is a massive part of that because, you know, you see him doing that wee... Yeah, uh, shimmy. <laughs> once he's when he'd when he'd uh, set the goal up, and you know, there's just a, a it is in in the ballpark of like the Tommy Burns team, you know, like the team that were. I mean, we just blew teams away under yeah. Tommy Burns. Um, it was just unfortunate that we were up against a a machine at the time in Rangers that you know um, won when it counted, but we 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 certainly gave them a a really good go at it. That in those few years. Just a few points, talking about Tommy Burns, and I'll never ever tire of talking about Tommy Burns on a Celtic State of Mind, um, but the one thing, and, and we keep saying it, the one thing that held that side back, I think, is a lack of a decent goalie. I never ever thought Tommy Burns had a decent keeper. Um, some people argue that it was maybe not to the same degree, but a similar issue that Martin O'Neill faced, and then you know he done all right, didn't he? Mm -hmm. <laughs> O'Neill O'Neill done okay, <laughs> but I mean, uh, in terms of the goalie, uh, no no being a standout, and I think that we've been kind of spoiled in modern day where you you think of the keepers that we've had, Boric and Foster and Craig Gordon, and now Joe Hart, who we will talk about at some point today. So you've got the excitement and the entertainment levels of a Tommy Burns side, like you say, plus individuals that you warm to. I mean, Burns' his team was full of them. You know, the three amigos who we loved. Let's you know, rewrite history. We loved all three of them. Andy, Tom, you know, these flamboyant players who we brought together. And I think that Angie's got the flair players that you just love to watch. And you know they're going to excite and entertain. Um, in terms of his wee jig, Jota can do anything he wants and it's not going to look embarrassing. But it was up there with Sviachenko against Hearts. You remember that one? When he done yeah. a wee dance. It's up there. I don't know which one was worse. But you know what? Uh, as I say, Jota can do 
anything he wants. It was interesting, actually, looking back at some of the pre-season um, uh, broadcasts that we did, JP, where people were talking about Jota and saying, well, you know, wingers are 10 a penny as long as we get Cameron Carter-Vickers. And, I, you know, other kind of throwaway comments like that, and I'm, I'm looking at the impact. I might have bought into it myself. I'm looking at the impact because I think my view on it was uh, a decent centre-half's harder to come by. That, that's mm-hmm. what I thought. And we've had a lot of flair players. And the two that I keep bringing up is Paddy Roberts and El Yunusi because they played in the same position of the park or could play in the same position of the park as, as Jota. But I, I think we've got something different with this guy. And I think that when you look at the international side of it, if he was to break into the... Inter- and by the way, anyone who's saying he's not going to break into the international squad, Glenn Leuven's broken into the <laughs> Netherlands squad when he was at Celtic, right? Mm. So there is a chance, JP, that Jota... And it will be enhanced by a good run in Europe. And then that takes me on to what you were saying about the European run last season. And I think you write off the Mitchelland one because it came far too early in the day for Ange and his team. Um, and then you're up against it because you had a goalie who was at his absolute worst at that point. And you've got one of your most experienced players getting sent off when you're one nothing up at home. So we were never going to win that tie, although we did push it through to extra time. And then it's kind of bookmarked, isn't it, uh, the European campaign with another poor performance against Bodo Glimt. But in between that, I do think we've seen enough. If you t- if you split up the three teams, it was Ferenc Varos, Betis and, and uh, Bayer Leverkusen, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there was enough from those three ties, if you like, to suggest that we're making progress. So mm. we get we got a, a, a sore one. We've got a, a black eye at, at Celtic Park against Leverkusen. But we've done enough away, although we didn't win, to show that we can compete with that team who finished yeah. third third in the Bundesliga. Mm-hmm. Um the, the performance away from home against Betis was quite astonishing, actually, when you watch it back. And mm. obviously, you know, we, we get points at home. And I keep going back to away, Leverkusen away. We're 2-1 up with eight minutes to go, JP. We're 2-1 up with eight minutes to go. And at that point, actually, uh, I remember watching the game th- thinking that we were quite comfortable at that stage. Mm. And I'm not saying we capitulated, but obviously we lost the game. If you win that game, you're second in the group. If you win that game away from home, so I'm like yourself. I'm not getting, you know, too overcritical about the European performance. I just think it was bookmarked by two particularly bad rounds, Mitchelland, Bodo Glen. But what we saw in the six games in between that, I think there's a lot to be uh, positive about. And as I said a couple of weeks back, I think Ange is a very quick learner. He's moved to Scotland. He's he's acclimatised very quickly in Scottish football. Um, you've seen the, you know, the obstacles that he faced maybe in the first six games, overcame them very quickly. And I think he's like that. He gives players a, a, a run and I think he makes his mind up pretty quickly. And he's done that with guys like Sorrow, for example. He's seen enough, right, move him on. He's seen enough with ball and go. You know, he doesn't mess around. And I think it's a, a bit like that with his approach to European football, albeit this time round it's the Champions League. And that's why I keep saying that, you know, we might see some brilliant performances this season. JP, but I don't know if we're going to make any progress. Maybe next season's the one that we're going to look at. But um, all will be revealed. And if your man Jota shows some kind of performance at Champions League level, then it's a case of we're going to have maybe a conversation in a year's time on this broadcast uh, about keeping Jota. And the £6 million or £6.5 million is going to look like a bargain at that stage if he turns it on. I think you you asked, well, we spoke about it and said, oh, which one would you take if it was a, if it was a straight... A straight decision between the two, and I said Cameron Carter Vickers, not because I didn't think Jota was good. I mean, obviously I do, and I did. Um, I just I thought about how troublesome it's been for us in defence uh, over uh, over a number of years. We've n- we've never really had a brilliant defence. It's always the defence has always been something we've struggled with, especially in European qualifiers. You know, like that's we've, we've always like roped in. A, a you know a beaton or whatever or a young a youngster or Owen O'Connell or yeah. Dean Murray you know like there's always been a gap to fill there and and that was that's, that was my thinking in regards to Cameron Carter Vickers because I just think he barely put a foot wrong last season and he's he's looked really assured again this season looks like he's taken the responsibility you know on as being that kind of senior guy in the central of the centre of defence um, but Jota. A hundred percent. You know his numbers last season were in, incredible, and they're already incredible for you know as only being a couple of weeks into the season. So, 
Aye. The thing is, I don't think you can argue with that because if you you've gone back as far as Brendan Rodgers there and, and mentioning uh, Owen O'Coyle, O'Connell rather, who we had to play in Europe. But one of the first things he did, um, Rodgers, is he brought in the experience of Toure. Now that isn't ideal, but he he's brought him in just to try and get us through the qualifiers. Mm. Um, obviously, it worked out pretty well, but it's been an issue, like you say, for for seasons and seasons. Uh, two seasons ago, the Shane Duffy issue. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that you know we've also had issues with the very first lineup. If you look at Bre- Brennan Rodgers' first competitive game against the Lincoln Red Imps, um, Effie Ambrose misjudges a bounce. You know, so he's playing. Effie Ambrose is playing in that game, and mm-hmm. you've got guys like Ryan Christie playing for Celtic that day. Um, he then faded out the picture and came back in, and then centre half situations with uh, bringing in Marvin Compere and Jack Hendry in season two. Not, neither of whom worked out for Celtic. So it has definitely been an issue. And once you get that partnership, then that, that's actually taking it to another level because, again, I'm going to jump back to the Tony Mowbray era. He comes in and he's got a side there that, uh, albeit in the last season, it was a bit of a, an anticlimax under Gordon Strachan. It was a side that largely had had, had seen us through two last 16 um, mm. qualification uh, campaigns in the Champions League and Tony Mowbray decided in his wisdom to break up the partnership at the back which was Caldwell and McManus now by the way I know that they're not the most popular players in Celtic's history but they had a solid partnership and we've got a, a solid partnership right now so for you to say that Carter Vickers was maybe the priority I don't think that should be a surprise I think that you know you, you start at the back and you move forward and then you bring in Jota and what he's done has been absolutely Phenomenal. I want to talk about another defender. In fact, there's going to be a discussion about two other defenders. But before I do that, um, Celtic 67 are telling us that the boys are big in Japan. And so they should be. Stevie boy, if they don't say how good Rage Against the Machine are, I'm off. Or how good they rocked, I'm off. Well, Stevie boy, you're you're absolutely preaching to the converted. I was introduced to Rage... um, because my big brother's a drummer and he's been a drummer in bands for many, many years and he's a bit of a rocker, which I'm not. I mean, I, I do appreciate a bit of rock, but I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a rocker, JP, but Rage Against the Machine, the, the debut album, absolutely had me hooked and I eventually went to see them with my big brother and it was one of the best gigs I've ever seen. i seen them in Reading 22, oh, yeah. tw- 22 years ago when Celtic were beating Rangers 6-2. Oh, yeah. Right. I'm, I'm watching Rage Against the Machine instead of being at that game instead of being at the game well wait, wait. You're, you've <laughs> left yourself open for criticism now haven't you People I know but Stevie Boy will be happy Stevie Boy will be happy that I went to I see Rage well, I, I was at the 6-2 game and I didn't see Rage until I was uh, 28 saw them in 2008 uh, headlining tea in the park probably the best headline set I've ever seen at a festival so if you're Swithering and you haven't got a ticket yet, get one for Ingolston on the 24th of August. Uh, first time they've played in Scotland since that that day or that night, 2008. So clearly they don't play Scotland that often. So it's an opportunity to see them and what a gig it will be. Run what, the I love, the what, what I love about them, JP, is I had a, a, a discussion. I'm, I'm, this next section, the, there is a wee warning going to flash up. Um, there's a couple of names getting dropped here. I'm sorry. We were with Stuart Cosgrove at the beginning of the week because we interviewed him for the channel. That will be available very soon. Um, But we we were interviewing him about his new book. He's written a book called Hey America. And you'll probably know that Stuart's a massive music fan and in particular a a massive soul fan. So the interview is about music. So there's your warning straight away, anybody who's not into that chat. The whole hour or so is about music. Um, and, you know, when you're, you're, you're looking at the scenario of a Stuart Cosgrove and what he has seen in his music-loving career, I mean, he used to write for the NME and that kind of stuff, uh, and the characters and the bands that he's seen who were very politicised. I mean, because soul music, you know, uh, his books, if you've read them, if not, go out and read his soul trilogy, it, it basically intrinsically links the music to the politics uh, and so Stuart and I were talking about how uh, there's not any great political voices or there's not enough great political voices in music these days. Mm. And, you know, there, there are exceptions, of course. I love what the Snuts have done. Um, Sleaford Mods, I think, are very outspoken in their lyrics and also in interviews. But one band who are very politicised and are never, ever afraid to air their views uh, in a political sense are Rage Against the Machine. 
So get yourself, as JP said, along on the 24th. You will not be dis... The scariest band I've ever seen as well, by the way, JP, in the crowd. It was a scary experience as well as being an amazing experience. I just enjoyed it because they were a band I'd listened to since I was a wee guy, since I was like, what, 11, 12? And then to finally actually see them live, but not just live, but like headline in a festival. I had seen the park as well, which I'd been to religiously. So, you know... It was it was like a a coming together of worlds that was just amazing for for me as as even as an older an older guy I still I didn't get in and crowd suffering like that you know I was mildly tempted but it, it was a wee bit wild further down there was like circle pits and all that going on and um, right that's you know. what I'm talking about circle pits now I didn't know what that was but if right. you can imagine right. You're, when you when you pull the plug out of a bath and what happens with the water, that's what happens in the middle of the crowd. I've described it as a kind of violent ringer ringer rosy. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> yeah. it's kind of that. It is a bit. It's when you when you look at it in the cold light of day, it's a bit ridiculous what actually happens. But I certainly wouldn't label that at anybody that's in the middle of doing it because they've probably got the head stuck in there or something like that. But yeah. uh, yeah, I slowly it's... backed out and continued to back out, and that was what I did. I but. Yeah. Honestly, go and watch some absolutely astonishing band. Um, and in these times, they have definitely got things to say about the way the world is being mm. run. Um, got to speak about Zhanovic, because this rumour just doesn't seem to be going away. We tried mm. to d- dismiss um, Fabrizio Romano a few weeks back, JP, but it keeps coming back. This time it's Chelsea, it's Man United. Um, he said interest from Atletico Madrid. Um, and just spoke out about interest for Zhanovic and also Matt O'Reilly. He doesn't seem that that worried, um, Ange Postecoglou. But it keeps coming back. Does that fill you with any concern? I, I, I mean, when, when Fabrizio Romano tweeted about it, you kind of did get the fear because of the guys, the, the weight that the guy's words seem to carry these days. You know, he's got however many million followers. Basically, any tweet he puts out usually gathers a lot of momentum and, you know likes and retweets and all that not that that necessarily means that everything he says is true but you do tend to think that if you've got that big a following you would be sure fairly sure about what you're putting out because it's your reputation and how he obviously values his reputation um and so that you got to think that he'd heard something at that time that, that there was there was premier league interest um from down south and well again there's more more sort of uh, traction coming from that now with the Chelsea stuff. So, like, I mean, I would hate it if he went to Chelsea, you know, absolutely hate it if he went there. You know, likewise, well, not that they need him, but Manchester City, you know, it would be really, a, it would be sore. It's one of those ones where it's like, well, you wouldn't want him to go to like a nothing team in the, in the English Premier League, but at the same time, you wouldn't want him to go to like a money bags team either because it's just, it just feels like he's only just started at Celtic. It doesn't feel like, you know, especially the Champions League football on the horizon, you know, he's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. got that as a carrot to stay. But then I do get that, you know, the money that would probably be getting talked about if, you know, I saw Tony Haggerty put, it would be 12, 15, 12 to 15 million to get around the table to discuss it. And, you know, that you've got to think, given recent transfers, elsewhere from Glasgow that it would be that sort of money that you would start with and then mm. go up to what, whatever fee. I, don't, I saw some people saying 40 and 50 million. I mean, that's that's a bit crazy. It's I don't, unrealistic. Yeah. I don't think he's anywhere near that. But I think, you know, certainly given the fact that if he's, his status as an international, you know, He's clearly, you know, a good player. I don't think we've seen anywhere near the best of them yet. I agree with that. I agree with that. I don't think he's at his peak at Celtic yet. I really don't. It seems to have been a bit stop start, JP, at Celtic. Yeah, the injury hasn't. The injuries didn't help him, I suppose. And you know, I think having such an able, well, such an able-bodied replacement in Ralston and the way that Ralston rise to, you know, um, prominence last last season maybe hasn't put the pressure on him as much to 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 come up with what what the performances that we think that he can come up with but i don't know it's one of those it's one of those ones where i i, I really if if someone if someone does come in with a crazy bid then 
the Celtic board will have to look at it unless he turns around and says that he's not interested. Um, but you would imagine, allegedly, Kieran Tierney wasn't interested in going to Arsenal. Um, but when a twenty five million pound bid comes in, it's you know some some there's going to be a discussion, isn't there? Well, um, for anyone, and I probably was in this camp. For anyone who thought that uh, not everyone has a place at Celtic. And, you know, you, you cling on to the traditions and um, the fact that certain players have come through and love the club. And for anyone who believed that, and maybe naively I did, the Kieran Tierney transfer blew that one out of the water, JP, because mm. if anyone was going to be a lifer at Celtic, it was going to be Kieran Tierney. But if you're that good, and as you say, the minute that type of offer comes in, the club will definitely consider it, seriously consider it. The question around what the offer would be to consider it is, is obviously a big one because I've said time and time again, I'd love to see, you know, Ange Postecoglou working with a group of people for four or five years. I'd love to see it. I know it's unrealistic, um, but if we were to sell one of those assets, and I, I definitely include Juranovic in that group of top, top class players that Ange has assembled, then I'd start worrying because my big worry would be, is this what Ange wants? Right, because let's be honest. No matter how much power a manager has at Celtic, it's never been enough, is it? Because you can be, you know, basically overruled um, when a twenty-five million pound bid comes in for a player. So, mm. on the one hand, I want to see that. I'd love to see this group of players constantly improving, being coached by Ange with his philosophy, and I'd love to see them develop naturally over a period of time. Um, four and five years. I think is probably unrealistic. But what about three? What about three? We're only in season two. It would feel almost as if it's unfinished business. Mm. If Juranovic goes and we'll need to bring in another right back and Ralston will be an able deputy until such times as someone else comes back in. But I just think that, you know, it would be definitely a step backwards. Yes, it's a lot of money. But with regards to where we are just now financially, do we need do we need the money? Uh I I'm not privy to the exact uh, uh, books of Celtic, but you would think that in, in the grand scheme of things, when you've brought in a player for, what, two, two and a half, two point seven million, whatever it was, Juranovic was bought for, if a £20 million bid comes in and the player is open to going, you know, so I get it. Does it come down to how, the, how much, what the player actually thinks? You know, because... Juranovic might not want to go, you know, mm -hmm. it might, or Celtic might turn around and offer him an improved deal because his wages right now will be based on a 2.7 million transfer, won't it? You know, so yeah, yeah, but, exactly. But then, but then are, they, are Celtic going to turn around and offer him a deal that's equivalent to what he would get down there? Absolutely no way because it will then upset the the structure within, within the club. But to me, actually, I don't think he's done enough yet to earn that new deal. You know, I, I don't really know if I could say hand on heart, does Juranovic 100% deserve a, a new deal at this point in time? It's an argument, I guess. I've seen I've seen performances from him. You know, I, I jokingly changed my Twitter account to a, a Joseph Juranovic fan account, like after um, one game in particular. And, and you know, I, I do, do really like the guy. But I think I think there's I think there's definitely a few more gears there, and I'd love to see them in a Celtic shirt rather than go see him go elsewhere and really motor on and become, you know, one of the most sought after right backs in in Europe or something crazy like that. Because, well, we saw it with Van Dijk. Mm -hmm. We all knew Van Dijk was going to go on and do really well. I mean, you could see that uh, instant, not instantly, but you could see it over a period of time. You know, watching him week in, week out, you knew that he was he had a higher level in him, and you knew that it was higher probably than Southampton. I'm not saying I had predict predicted he would win the Champions League or anything like that, but you just knew that he could hold his own at a far higher level. Yeah, um, and and Jur Juranovic has shown enough in certain games to suggest that he would be able to do that as well. I'll certainly, you know, play at a, a higher level in, in, in Scotland. I think. European football is um, absolutely pivotal to the actual price that clubs will be willing to pay. And I, I think if you look at Bassi as an example, in terms of the um, fluctuation of a player's value, you have a good campaign in Europe or a few good games in Europe and mm. it can it can go right up to, you know, the, See, was it, was the higher reaches. 
at no. Rangers at the start of last season. He wasn't getting a game. And then, what, from the turn of the year, basically, he played week in, week out. And, you know, anything I saw of him, I was impressed with the guy. Do you know what I mean? And I have to say, hats off to them. Uh, they, they obviously overturned the deficit from, from last week. I slagged them last week. <laughs> um, so I'll give them praise this week through gritted teeth. Um you know, to overturn that, but that 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 game last week, that'll be their Lincoln Red Imps because we still get we still get slagged about the Lincoln Red Imps game, even though we overturned it in the second mm-hmm. leg. The fact that we lost to you know European uh, sort of minnows. I mean, that was what Union Union Sangal was his first European game in fifty odd years or something like that. They hadn't scored goals in the tournament or in any tournament in Europe. So I'm not saying that I would slag them off for that forever, but I'm just I'm I'm weighing it up against what we get slagged with a bit a bit red imps because the red imps slagging is, you know, yeah, okay, we lost a game against them, but then we absolutely battered them at Celtic Park. So it's hardly Aye. something to you know st- you know hang your hat on forever. My my signal went there, so apologies anybody if I was uh, talking into dead air. But JP kept it going and reminded us just how great that red imps victory was. Um <laughs> JJ, right back, I mean, you know, what I'm going to finish off by saying is, um, no, I don't think it's the right time to move him or any of the star players on. I think that there's a group of players who showed up really well last season, JP, but I don't think we've seen the best of them. Actually, I started calling them, like, you know, this is version two of likes uh, uh, Rio Atati, Matt O'Reilly, possibly Jota and the likes of Juranovic. I just don't think that we saw them at their full pelt last season, and we're going to see it this season, I would be very disappointed if any of them were to leave before we saw them um, fulfilling their potential at Celtic first. But one guy who I think is fulfilling his potential, and he's turning a lot of people's um, views of him completely around is Greg Taylor. And I want to touch on that. I know the guys yesterday spoke um, in glowing terms about Greg Taylor. The reason we were 60 seconds late in coming on live today is because our good pal Tommy Sheridan was in the studio this morning. What I love, right, is anybody's welcome to visit us in here, JP, right? We don't always have stuff in the fridge, but we've always got um, stuff to make you a cup of tea or coffee. And uh, Tommy was in with his big pal Frank McGarvey. So can you imagine just sitting and listening to these guys chewing the fat and disagreeing and arguing about football, etc. But one of the things they were talking about was Greg Taylor. Mm-hmm. Um and I think that he is in the running for most improved player this season so far. Uh, last year, obviously, I would have given that to Tony Ralston. This year, it could be the, the, the turn of Greg Taylor to, to really step in. And I think that a massive part of that, maybe people will argue that he started this running form last season, could well be the fact that we brought in someone apparently to replace him. Uh, who we haven't seen in action yet, the first Argentinian to, to play for Celtic. How impressed have you been with Greg Taylor so far? Just carried on from last season, isn't he? You know, like he played played really well, particularly in the second half of last season. And you're just finding yourself he's been a he has been a bit of a scapegoat at times. Mm. I don't know if it's the fact that he came from another Scottish club, you know, and, and hasn't got Celtic you know, o- openly admitted he's a Celtic fan or anything like that. I think there's, there's that always maybe kind of plays a part. I, I don't know. I need to ask. They need to ask the people that you know would still find reason to criticise Greg Taylor even if he had a good game. You know, and there, and there are many people that you see commenting that are like that. You know, they're just. I mean, I, I've seen Greg Taylor have bad games, and you know, maybe some in Europe. I remember saying to somebody, oh, you know, that's where Greg Taylor kind of falls down, you know, when we get to this next level, is he good enough to play, you know, is Greg Taylor good enough to start in the Champions League, for example? You know, say we get, I don't know, Real Madrid, is, is Greg Taylor starting a left-back? Well, probably, yeah, because you're not going to start Bernabe um, out of nowhere if, if Greg Taylor's been playing week in, week out. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. right now, whether or not you agree he's Champions League quality, he will be playing left back for Celtic in the Champions League. That that might have some people spitting out their coffee or their tea, you know. But it's a fact of life at this moment in time. We're not going to go out and sign a ready-made left back to come in. We've we've signed a guy to give him competition at at some expense as well, and that guy's not getting anywhere near the team at the moment because of Greg Taylor's Greg Taylor's performances mm-hmm. and. 
you know, it, he's he's now in what his third year at the club was kind of unfancied when he was brought in. You didn't you started to wonder whether or not you know he was Lennon signing. You know, uh, I mean, was that already in the works before Lennon came? Lennon didn't fancy him, it would seem at the start, and then he's slowly but surely starting to become a bit of a voice in the dressing room, a, a voice on, you know, Celtic social media and all that. And, you know, it, it, he's definitely a popular a popular person, it would seem, you know, like just judging by what I can gauge from what I see, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know the guy, but you can, you can get the vibe that he is a bit of a, a like, a likeable character. And I don't care if he has Rangers leniencies or has, his family have Rangers leniencies. It's about what he does in the park for Celtic, and if he's playing well for us, what does any of that matter? Do you know what I mean? It's it's kind of it's, it's there's not there's no there's no there's not there's nothing to be said about that really. If you know, no, you're but, right. We know the examples. We know all the famous examples of uh, players who came through um, as Rangers fans. And by the way, Danny McGreen wasn't one of them because I asked him live once on stage, and he said. That, no, he was never a Rangers fan. Kenny Dalglish was. Mm-hmm. Um, many others have been. Charlie Miller was a Celtic fan, did all right for Rangers. Um, Simon Donnelly's dad played with Rangers, and Simon was brought up a Rangers man, but the day that he left Queen's Park and signed for Celtic, and when you speak to him now, JP, you know. 100%. Aye. <laughs> exactly. He's, he's a Celtic fan, but there are people you know, who still hold it against you. I don't. I just look at the performance of uh, Greg Taylor this season. I just think... Wow. I mean, um, has it gone up a couple of notches because you've got this guy breathing down your neck? Maybe. We've spoke about that with Seagrist and, and uh, Burnaby. And, and we spoke about it also uh, with, let me get this right, Moritz Jens. For Joe Hamilton, who sh- tunes into Axon, apologies if my pronunciation was incorrect. Thank you for picking up on it. And hopefully I got it right this time, pal. Um, again, he comes in. At a time when our first choice centre half, Carl Starfelt, is injured, he's been replaced in the pre-season and the first game of the season by Stephen Welsh. Julian's out the picture. We bring in Jens, and so far so good. Were you impressed with his debut? Yeah, I. I mean, uh, again, I can't really. Call, I, I feel a bit redundant. It's not often that I'll come on here and say. I either didn't see the game or I wasn't at the game, you know? Like, were you at the, day, were you at the game today, Caller? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a family funeral, yeah, but were you were you at the game? Aye, Aye. Aye. no bother. Um, no, the, the, so, I mean, from what I've listened to and heard from people that were there, things I've read about his performance, you know, you've got to sort of say that he wasn't up against the, the best strikers that he'll ever face. Mm. Um, but... The, the Celtic shirt can weigh heavy on some players and, you know, some people might wilt in that in that atmosphere, you know, it's, you know, Dingwall is usually quite a difficult place to go, although we seem to have a good record up there of late, um, but it, it can be a, a sticky place to go, as other teams found out last season. Um, so, you know, it, it's not a given that he was just going to come in and, and be all right, and I suppose to get a goal and to immediately earn some uh you know credit with the with the support particularly an away game i think you score it an away game it always seems to especially a big goal like that and it was a big goal you know we mm. were we were at one each and we needed we needed something from somebody and uh and and he came up with it so i think that's definitely but how how things are going to go for sunday now i don't know because i don't think welsh's illness was too serious. It's obviously serious enough to keep him out for, of the game on Sunday. But um, you know, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people. We spoke about this last week about how Welsh is kind of unfancied. So there'll be a lot of people who'll be like, right, uh, keep Jens in. You know, well, that's Welsh bombed out, and you know, Starfelt will be in the bench or whatever. So I don't know. Will Postecoglou stay loyal to Jens, who's coming and done a job, and is mm. it Welsh's jersey to earn back? And also Starfelt's jersey to earn back, you know. I, I I don't know. I don't know how he does that because it's it's, it's not it's not often that we've had that problem at centre half. You know, we've never I had know. this kind of like everybody's vying for what well, one one jersey's gone already. That's you know, there's no question. Carter Vickers is starting, but then you've got 
three people with a well, a, a legitimate claim for the other one. You know, Jens could point to last week and go, well, I scored a goal and played in a winning side. Welsh scored a goal in the first game and played in a winning side. And Starfelt was part of a really successful, well, the best defence in the league last season. And it's coming back from injury. So they've all got, you know, a reason to say, well, I should have that jersey, which is really healthy, but it's a, a headache for the manager. Yeah. And, and now what we've got, of course, is four defenders, four centre-halves who you can call upon. And I think with confidence, some people say when it comes to Europe, they might not fancy Welsh, just like the argument that you that you put forward uh, earlier on about uh, Taylor, because we always talk about step up in class. But what we do have is four defenders that can play centre-half. And, and we've also got Julien, who... We don't talk about that often because he's so far out the picture. This if he greatest social media patter can bolt. Did you see it? He's like putting an emoji of himself up with like a song that was kind of like a woe is me thing. And you're just like, no, oh, man, don't, don't dig yourself any more holes than you've already done. You know, that the aeroplane one with the eyes was enough. Like, if I'm a fan and I'm getting a wee bit miffed at that, what's the manager thinking? Because that's all going to get back to the manager. Mm -hmm. No time to tell me that Postacoglu isn't aware of things that go on. He's a, he strikes me as the type of guy that will make sure he's aware of everything that goes on, much the same way as, you know, Alex Ferguson used to know all the taxi drivers in Manchester and, you know, would, would get a call or a text from them to say, oh, I had such and such in the back of the car at, at 2 a.m. So he mm -hmm. knew if these players were, you know, out and about, um, about town when they shouldn't have been in you know, I, I would imagine Postacoglu is the same type of guy, like old school type of guy that will have it, you know, whilst they might not sit, be sitting watching all their Instagram stories, he'll, he'll know from somebody that that's been put out there. And it'll, well, if it's kind of mildly miffed to me, then that's his boss. <laughs> I know, I know. It's probably Declan McConville. He'll be the guy that reports back to Andrew <laughs> about the social media antics of Celtic screen. players. <laughs> a wee WhatsApp group between him, Peter Lowell and Ange. There you go, lads. Um, I want to talk about John Kennedy very briefly, but you, you brought back to, to mind a wee story someone told me in here. And they were going on about that whole taxi driver thing, like you were saying there, you know. Jockstein always had this massive network of people who would feed back to him, my wee jinkies in having a pint and all this stuff. And taxi driver chat. And uh, what, they, what they were telling me is back in the day, if Hibs and Hearts were both interested in a player, then Hibs would put it out to very specific taxi drivers who they trusted um, that that player was doing this and doing that, drinking too much, womanising, all this stuff, knowing that it would get back to Hearts, it would maybe switch them off the player. And it was mm. all just a pack of lies, you know, spreading rumours. Um, so there you go, that's how to get your man in Scottish football. Tell a few taxi drivers a few untruths. Um, there was a story there during the week about John Kennedy uh, getting interest, gathering interest from the aforementioned Mitchelland. Um, do you think the time will come? Or is J John Kennedy one of these guys that is eternally a number two? <laughs> and what I mean is an assistant manager. Mm, um, potentially, yeah. It depends how settled he is. In what age is he, JP? Scotland, isn't it? Is he not about... 39 or something like that like maybe um, that's a guess but it depends if he's I mean there'd be a big deal moving over to Denmark I suppose if you were going to you know uproot and move to a different country when to my mind he's never lived anywhere else other than Scotland I don't mm. unless somebody knows otherwise but you know I suppose it's one of those ones where it's like if you're in a job that you love and you obviously love Celtic and well paid for it, I'm sure, you know, and it's a bit of a risk going to leave that kind of bubble and leave that say, safety net of, of, of being somewhere where he's kind of, you know, despite managers leaving, he's kept his job. And the, 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 I never really had an, a massive issue with, with John Kennedy or Gavin Strachan last season, or sorry, two seasons ago. My, my issue always was whether or not the, 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 the manager who was in, in position or in situ wanted them to be there. And Postacoglu clearly wants them to be there. There'll probably still be people out there that'll be like, oh, you know, that they're, they're, they're there against his will. And, you know, there was a guy, do you remember that guy, Joe somebody that constantly commented saying that 
uh, John Kennedy was going to be the manager of the Celtic. He, he basically said that every single show um, that and that that was going to happen. And you know, when when Lennon left, it was Kennedy's job and all this sort of stuff. And I remember replying to him, going, "There's absolutely no way Celtic are appointing John Kennedy as manager after this absolute nightmare of a season." You know, they needed somebody you know, to come in and, and galvanise the support. And it wasn't going to be John Kennedy that was going to do that. And fortunately for Celtic and for us, it's been Postacoglu that's done that, but it was never going to be John Kennedy. And it just seemed like, I don't know, when would the time be right for John Kennedy to ever be Celtic manager? I don't know if he would ever be accepted as a Celtic manager. Um, now, well, here, That's a great point, just as Paddy comes in, JP, what you're saying. If Kennedy goes, will fans be annoyed or happy? And that's an interesting way to look at it. Because, like you say, there was this period of time where Kennedy and Strachan were getting it along with Neil Lennon, weren't they? They were yeah. getting the, the abuse, they were getting the uh, criticism. Mm. And uh, there was a suggestion that, you know, we're going to go for the cheap option, as it was described, and John Kennedy would be the gaffer. Um, but I think you go back to Ronnie Dyla, you go Neil Lennon, Brennan Rogers, Ange Borsacoglu, and you think, well... If those four guys seen something in them, and they're working with them day in day out, they're seeing a lot more than what we are because obviously we are just uh, bystanders looking in, trying to um, create some kind of sense of what's happening at Celtic when it's good and when it's bad. And I think just checking his age by the way, thirty eight. So it, I mean, it seems almost like it's been ages that he's been serving this apprenticeship, and yeah. that he must be. But obviously, he got into the management game very very early. Um, and I, I do like the fact that he's got a tremendous connection to the club. Granddad was Jimmy Delaney, and he has been very loyal to the club as well. I think there was talk that maybe Hibs at one point were quite interested in taking up the Easter Road. But perhaps he should just look at um, a player he came through with in Sean Maloney and how well regarded Sean Maloney was, uh, you know, with Martinez. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he, he flies the nest, he flees the nest, and... Before you know it, your, your kind of managerial reputations and tatters, you know, within about six months, JP. So, I, I think is it's that a, fair though. Is that fair that Maloney's manager managerial reputation should be in tatters? I, I'm not too sure. I don't know if the, I don't know if that's altogether fair. Like, I, I I do I do wonder. I mean, people will have argument for that either way. Though you know, there'll be Hibs fans maybe that'll be like, you know, I. I I, just, I wasn't entirely sure that Hibbs was the right job for him in the first place. Proved obviously not to be the right job for him, but I don't necessarily think that that should be the end of Maloney's career. I think the way that he was, you know, carved up by the media while he was still in position, and, and after only a couple of weeks, you had folk like Chris Boyd basically slagging him off for the language that he was using and things like that. And mm -hmm. you're just like, I mean, it just it, it it struck me going back to the likes of Paul Le Guin going in at Rangers and, you know, people questioning Paul Le Guin, you know, when he's come from a really successful club and questioning his methods and everything else. It's like, guy's a successful coach and he's wanting to implement a new style and a new and new ideas. And mm -hmm. Maloney just seemed to get absolutely slaughtered for that uh, from the from the get-go. I don't, I don't know what will happen with, with Sean Maloney long term. Maybe he won't become a manager, but I certainly don't think he should be written off on the basis of the Hibs, um, the Hibs sort of situation that happened. It was, I think Hibs, is, you know, I mean, obviously they're going through the transition now with a new manager, whether or not he'll, you know, last the last the pace. There's question marks from Hibs fans on 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 him already as well. <laughs> so he's only a few games away from, you know, the knives being out. Definitely, I think Hibs' uh, problems were uh, much deeper than Sean Maloney, and mm -hmm. um, Sean Maloney just seemed to be in the wrong movie when he went to Easter Road. And like you say, he's trying to implement things, JP. And there's been a lot of examples of that in Scottish football. Ronnie Dyla had some opposition at Celtic. Some of the senior pros didn't buy into what he was trying to implement. Um, Paul Le Guin was a great example. I mean, even down to anyone who comes in with new ideas about diet and conditioning, um, you know, seemed to be frowned upon. And there was a suggestion that the same group of players who had done pretty well for Jack Ross, I mean, pretty well, you, you, they finished third for the first time in 17 years, you mm. know, the previous season. Um, 
I, and I don't like the term down tools, right? Because it's almost, when you use that terminology, you're almost suggesting that there's a meeting somewhere behind the scenes, a clandestine agreement, we're not playing for this gaffer. But I just mm. think that if there's a group of guys, even if it's four or five strong, who just don't buy into it, then they're not given the extra percentages required to win games, to go on a run of wins, JP. So in effect, they are down in tools, but not um, as deliberate as that su suggests. And that, I think, did happen. It just didn't work out for him at Hibs. I don't think it's fair if that's going to you know, tarnish any future career because it wasn't that long ago people were talking about how glowing a career he was going to have mm. um, after his time under Martinez at Belgium. So that would be unfortunate. John Kennedy, uh, who knows if he does, then I'm pretty sure... Uh, your man Kuhl, Harry Kuhl, will be stepping into the berth. But we shall see. Um, we've had a few different different views coming through on the Kennedy question. Some people are saying, oh, I can take Strachan with him. Um, but, I mean, listen, it's working. It's working pretty well this season and last, isn't it? part of a successful setup that's happening I know. right now. And, like, they're... It's, it, yeah, obviously, Postacoglu is the, the main man. But, I mean, he's getting a tune out of these guys to do something. You know, they're not... They're not robots. They're obviously being influenced by his, you know, methods. And I, 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 I can't, I can't criticize the guys. You know, I, I, I've never met either of them, and I don't know enough about them as personalities to, to say I don't like them or get rid of them or anything like that. You know, as far as I'm concerned, if the manager, who I 100% buy into, because I see him and hear him all the time, you know, and media and everything else. If he is happy with them, I've got absolutely no issue with them at all. <laughs> you also go you go on what a lot of the players say. Um, and some players who have left the club, I think Chris yeah. Iyer mentioned it in his yeah. statement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just how big an influence John Kennedy was to him. And, uh, Kendall, as he's known. Kendall, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, big Kendall. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see how that goes. But as I say, I, I think he's been a very loyal uh, servant to Celtic and I love the fact that there's that family connection going right back to Jimmy Delaney um, whose jersey by the way his jersey is the oldest jersey in my Celtic book there's my plug amazing I'll, getting I'll, all the plugs I'll, in speaking of servants to Celtic uh, just wanted to mention on air because I saw his son's tweet about it just asking people to um, if, if, they, if they wanted to pay their respects to Yogi Hughes tomorrow the funeral cortege is uh, going to be at the Celtic Way at quarter to two, I think it is, one forty-five. So, yeah, I I think I'm going to go along. And uh, he, he scored in the, the Leeds United game, didn't he? Yeah, he did, aye. It was at, at Hamden, right? At the, Hamden. The, the, the crazy attendance one. Yeah, so it was really? John Hughes and Bobby Murdoch and uh, Billy Brunner, Celtic fan, scored for Leeds that night, 2-1. So, my mum, right, who did not like... Until Martin and Neil didn't like Celtic at all, right? She, she absolutely didn't want me involved with Celtic. I was nearly to wear a Celtic strip in Bathgate. You know, Bathgate was a very different place back in the 80s and 90s as to what it is now. It's, it's far more liberal and, you know, there's Celtic strips all over the place. But wearing a Celtic strip back then, you were kind of dicing with death a little um, in terms of... Uh, if I did wear it, I'd been, I was spat at and, you know... You know, name calling and all the rest of it. It was, it was, yeah, pretty grim. But um, my mum uh, was at that game at, at Hamden. She was there. Uh, randomly got taken by a couple of people from Falkirk. I can't remember who they were. She told me I'll need to ask my uncle. But she was at that game, and I remember being like, "You were there, like so." So up until I think the Bordeaux game when Last Land scored. My mum hadn't been at any... I took my mum to that Celtic-Bordeaux game, remember when Last Land scored and I think it was at the last minute or something like that and they beat, they beat us. Was that, was that the game Maravchik scores? Maravchik scored at uh, yeah. Celtic Park. Yeah, I was yeah. there. Aye. Aye. Aye, aye. So I, I took my mum to that game because she'd kind of got the bug again. Well, not the bug, but she'd kind of... I think it was because I was going to all the games and she liked keeping in touch with, with Celtic and knew that I was at the games and everything else. And Martin and Neil, she liked Martin and Neil. But yeah, I, I couldn't believe that she was at that game at, at Hamden. You know, at that the, the, the crowd was like, it was over 100,000, wasn't it? It was, some it's, it's, absolute, it was a record attendance, I'm sure. 137. And that was at the time, right, that a lot of the, the people on the ground wouldn't have been counted because obviously kids getting carried over the the gate and all that kind of stuff. So you imagine there might have been 150,000 
mm-hmm. but 137 was the official attendance. Um, yeah. and, and I think, uh, again, I'm going to have to tell this story because it's a cracker. You're talking about the Leeds game. A group of um, Celtic players at the time who weren't in the first team went down to the game. And it was guys like Ward White, uh, John Gorman, uh, I think maybe maybe Kenny Dalglish was there. And uh, so they've gone down to the game. And I think one of them knew Billy Bremner. And so there was an uh, agree. It might have been John Gorman actually, because I think you know Bremner was from the Raplock and Gorman was from Winchborough. And for some reason, maybe their paths had crossed schoolboy level or something. And um, so they had agreed that they were going to meet at Billy and stay the night at Billy Bremner's house after the game down in Leeds. And when they've gone down and they've gone to the game after the game, they've gone to the address. It was all locked up. I don't know if Bremner and the boys had gone out for a a drink to uh, commiserate. So they broke into his house, JP. They broke into Billy Bremner's house and by the time he comes back, these Celtic players are in his house having a drink and all that kind of stuff. Bizarre, bizarre tales, but a legendary game. I right. cannot I cannot say... What's this? It's my... This is from when I was a, a wee guy, right? And I've got, a few, I've got a few in here, but I knew I had this because I remember meeting him in the reception. Yogi oh, Hughes. Oh, yeah. immense. And I, just, I love how he's got... He's put Celtic FC underneath it. It's proper old school. I know. You know. Um, this is me of of Celtic Football Club, and I, I, you, know, you can tell if someone's signing an autograph like that, then you know how proud they are to be associated with Celtic. So I met, oh, I, I, met I, I don't even think when I got that autograph that I had a, a real grasp of what he did for Celtic and who he was. You know, mm. um, I, I probably had no idea because I. I I wasn't quite as clued up when I was a, a younger guy of really, you know, Celtic players from before my time. It was all about the present for me as a wee guy. But then as you get older, you look to you look to the past and you start appreciating the history a lot more, I think. And, and well, that's, that's, I certainly have done. You do. That, that's brilliant. I love all that stuff. I love how you keep things. It's tremendous. You document things. But the funniest story... Oh, and I, right. I don't mind uh, name dropping again, right? Because I get slagged for it anyway. But the funniest story I ever heard about signing your name and then putting something underneath it was Jim Craig was was saying that um, they were outside the ground and some of the young boys started coming through. Obviously, McGrain was his understudy. Eventually, took the number two shorts, etc. And he says, Big George was one of the first. George Conley was one of the first to break in from the Quality Street gang. And he used to sign his name and underneath it, he used to put HVF. And it took a, a, a few weeks before Jim finally says to him, George, I've been trying to figure out what that means. I mean, is it a qualification? Have you got hiring some? And he was like, no, son, High Valley Field. <laughs> <laughs> High Valley Field, he says. Love that story. Love that story. Brilliant. Superb. We can't go off today without talking about that jersey over your shoulder, though, JP. Um, yeah. And I think it would be easy for me to just say Larson when I see it, because I do... I do remember... I mean, it's the player that comes to my mind... Henrik Larson, would that be the same with you? Yeah, it, because of that Scottish Cup final, wasn't it? It was the 2004 Scottish Cup final. Um, was that against Dunfermline? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I remember I didn't get a ticket for that. Um, watched it at my mum's, um, which was really weird at the time because anything, any big games I ever watched at that time, it was always either in like the Hoops Bar or you know, the IB in Edinburgh where the, my supporters club left from. So to watch it in my mum's flat was kind of like, I didn't really, you didn't have the atmosphere, you know, it was kind of, I, I can't remember why I didn't watch it in a bar, but um, yeah, something I, yeah, I guess like just any any of those, those O'Neill era players like Petrov and stuff like that, they were, they were all wearing it, but it is a, it is a crack and top. Long sleeve as well. Long sleeve. Although, Brilliant. I didn't. I didn't ask for. I, I would prefer if it didn't have the sponsor, because that's the one thing that I always do now is get a talk about the sponsor. And I didn't. I didn't obviously know that that was a thing at that time, because obviously it's an it's it's booze. As soon as it's booze or betting or anything like that, you you have to be able to provide a. Or certainly now, I don't know if it was the same back then, but um, you have to provide a no sponsor option. So. Mm. The the sponsorless tops, long sleeved, are always the best. Embroidered crests, of course, that's all the hallmarks of a classic Celtic jersey. Mm-hmm. Um, 
listen, it's always an absolute pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. I know that we do talk a wee bit about music on a Thursday, but hey, it wouldn't be a Thursday without it, JP. Uh, we do go on a few tangents as well, and we do try and plug a few things, and that's why I'm asking you, if you want to come to Dunfermline for a, a night of entertainment, including the Chase, who are all big Celtic fans, then tomorrow night, come along to PJ Malloy's, 20% off if you click the link below. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved in the chat, and thank you to JP Mason for joining me once again on a Celtic State of Mind.